Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, before we start this session, I would like to say our prayers, our hearts uh, is with Lebanon. Inshallah, this is this time will pass, and we hope everyone stays safe there. Uh, on behalf of the Pact, uh, the Pact uh, Society, the GIS, and Medtronic, we just wanted to send our warm feelings to everyone. And with that, I would like to introduce our chairperson for today. Uh, first of all, my name is Mohamed Jaha, for those who don't know me. I'm the senior market development for Medtronic. And let me introduce for you a man who doesn't really need that much introduction, Dr. Professor Hani Ragi from Egypt, who is a godfather guru in interventional cardiology from the National Health Institute in Cairo. And I had the pleasure to work with him before. And Dr. Hani will take us through today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, uh, I really value your uh, friendship before everything and also your technical and scientific excellence and expertise and the times when we worked together uh, in the Texan nurses course uh, was very educational for me and I actually uh, learned a lot um, and enjoyed it uh, more than many, many courses. So, uh, we're looking forward to a very important course today, uh, and, and which is going to be the part of, of many courses, of many ones to come. Um, and it's, today we're going to talk about access. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, um, involved in this because uh, access, meaning whether we're going to go radial, femoral, subclavian, or from the neck. Uh, or a cut down is uh, something where the tech and the nurse have a vital role. It's a pivotal role. And uh, it's very, very important. Uh, and uh, it is the beginning of any procedure. And it is where problems, if you start having a bad access, the whole day is going to be a nightmare. Uh, if the access is smooth, um, then you can probably focus on what's really important, whether it's your angioplasty or your TAVI or whatever. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker uh, who needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Khaled Al-Juhani is, is an uh, associate professor of cardiology uh, from Saudi Arabia. He is uh, an expert in complex interventional cardiology. He's an expert in so. Is an expert in radial and uh, uh, operators, chip operators, uh, chip, you know, the, the indicated complex and duplicity operators like Dr. Al Johani are actually access experts as well because those people don't want to waste time on access and then uh, they want to spend their valuable time on doing what's difficult, like a retrograde approach. So I can't wait to hear him. Uh, start this presentation, and um, I welcome him, and I'm so happy to be with uh, introducing him and to be uh, chairing the session today. And I would like to thank the sponsors, Metronic and Mohamed Jehan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani, for this nice introduction. Again, thank also to Metronic for the invitation. Uh, the structure, the way we structured it, me and Muhammad, that we want to do it as it is like the flow in the cath lab, a nurse, then the physician, the nurse. So probably Muhammad will start and then I'm going to take over after he starts the pre-cath preparation and we'll go deep into some of the details about uh, choosing and maintaining an access. So go ahead, Muhammad. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Khaled. So guys, everyone online, the chat room is open, so we will, read, will be ready to take uh, the question from you. I'm going to start again with the lecture about the cardiac cath nursing management. So this is actually a presentation, uh, which is actually even a policy that we used a long time ago when we were in Prince Sultan, and where, where I was at nurse clinician, we had act, uh, the duties of actually helping into writing these policies. So. It's actually uh, the purpose of the policy to ensure the staff nurses provide safe and constant pre and post procedure care who underground, uh, undergoing cardiac cath uh, procedure. All staff nurses uh, are, uh, and pay, uh, are required of caring for patients. And actually remember, taking care of a patient inside the cath lab is not just a nurse job. 
we we'll remember we called PACs, the technologists, nurses, radiographers, technicians, they all have to be the patient uh, caretakers. So, number, uh, so the staff nurse will need to identify patient's education needs and ensure pre and post care, care provided to all patients. So education is the key point of any care of a patient. Uh, so they need to make sure the patient needs to be receiving all of the preload medication, everything. So when the patient comes to the cath lab, we have to identify the patient. And uh, in Saudi, GCR is a very important uh, standard that we follow. So patient identification used uh, clearly with uh, both patients, two bands is usually not one band, complete documentation for pre cath uh, assessment investigation. Some hospital has a standard uh, pre cath form specific for that unit. Some uh, hospital use the data flow that you use from the ward and continue on with. Uh, make sure constant and free medication will be arranged for the cardiac cath lab reporter. Free medication could be either just the loading dose of Plavix, Sometimes they give Valium, sometimes they don't, depending on the policy of the hospital in which region you're at. And assess the patient for a document for any allergy. And it's very important, we give contrast. You might need to give a loading dose of uh, hydrocort or anything. And keep the patient MPO. Now, MPO is tricky. Some people say MPO for eight hours, some, uh, some physicians say six hours. And maybe we'll need to ask Dr. Khaled, Dr. Hanid later on about their opinion about it. Some says MPO is only from hard, uh, hard food, nothing but fluid, it's okay to take it, uh, MPO. Chest X-ray may be ordered in some hospital, like for example, in PCC, one important thing that we used to do, is important that we have a cross-match for all patients. It's a requirement in uh, Prince Sultan. Some uh, other hospitals, and a lot of the private hospitals don't require cross-match anymore. Uh, and they have the patient be echoes to be done, uh, recent pain, free ECG, and uh, yeah. So the blood work that they require that we have to do as nurses and uh, for standard is full blood count, urea, creatine, electrolyte, renal parameter, INR, and INR less than 1.5, especially it's really radial, uh, group and safe, as I said uh, uh, before, pregnancy test for ladies who are actually under 50 years old. So we have to make sure before the patients are coming, we used to tell them, okay, go Baba, shave your groin at home and come back or something. But we stopped that. We're actually doing it prior to in the cath lab. Reason is we don't want them to use the sharp razor. We want them to use the clippers. And we usually prepare bilateral groin. And, we, uh, and also we try to see even the rest if they need shaving. Uh, PIV is inserted according to procedure. So it's right radial, usually we do keep the IV cannula left arm, not even left hand. So if we need to go left radial, sometimes we have cabbage patients, so we might go in that way. Uh, patients should take a shower before they come into the hospital, uh, especially if they're day case or inpatient. Um, then uh, then the um, uh, patient, the surgical gown is, uh, depending on the policy, Try to get the surgical gown that doesn't have metal buttons in it because sometimes in the x-ray, even if they take it off, but they're still wearing it, but it's off the patient, it can get on the x-ray. So we used to have the wrap, uh, the wrap surgical gown. Check to ensure patient uh, if they have denture. They used to say remove the denture, it should be without denture, but now uh, they say keep the denture on. You want to communicate with the patient, so it's okay. Jewelry, nail polish, you need to be careful with them. Uh, try to remove jewelry as much as possible. Sometimes henna on the hand uh, give you an issue with your pulse oximeter, so that's, you have to be careful with that. So if you, the patient's day case, we usually store the valuables, and we have a custody documentation, ensure a patient has voided, um, and then we check the pulses. Now, important. Check your pedial, uh, tibial, uh, tibial and pedial pulses, your radial pulses bilateral, so you could actually compare before and after. And for us, for the day case, they usually admit six, uh, six o'clock in the morning. So what we used to do, they come to the, uh, to the clinic the day before, they, for the day case, for example. Uh, they come to the clinic the day before, they do the blood work, they get their uh, loading dose of flux and x-ray and everything done one day before. By the time they arrive 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., and depending on the schedule and how we do it, depending on their day, um, they should be uh, prepared. Uh, sometimes uh, oral hypoglycemia and insulin are uh, halt. Uh, blood sugar has been checked uh, throughout the day, and yeah. So if there's any anticoagulation, the patient's on, it's usually been held a few days before the, uh, the 
procedure just to drop that INR. Um, form is completely, and that's mainly it. So that's my uh, my part for the precast. I'm going to go to Dr. Khalid now, and he will take us through the procedure. Well, thank you, Mohammed. It was a really nice introduction for the pre uh, pre cath care, which uh, includes some inform information that is very important and relevant to the procedure and to the patient and to the nursing staff. Obviously. Uh, all of this has been usually seen in the pre cath clinic if the patient is elective. Yes. Uh, do I see my slides, guys? Not yet. C can I ask a quick question before he starts? Yes, Dr. Hani. Uh, yes, Dr. Um, for instance, for the peripheral pulses and for the INR and for the, and for the medications that the patients are taking, uh, there are usually hospital forms that people fill. Uh, okay. So after they check the peripheral medications, uh, the peripheral pulsations, for instance, they don't just mm -hmm. go and say, okay, he has good peripheral pulsation, but they actually no. mark in a sheet. So yes. um, uh, some of these are available online, but I, mm -hmm. I would appreciate it if you can, uh, if you can uh, pass on one of these uh, even after the meeting. To the attendees. Okay, I'll go check my contact, and I think I used to have a copy. And sure, one day I'll actually I'll post it to you, Dr. Hani, and we could distribute it from your side. Even you have a big population, okay. <laughs> that would be great. Okay, okay. And thank one, you. One note. One note to the, what Mohammed said about the MPO. Actually, since I started my fellowship, it's not routine to keep patients MPO for the. The flow for the sake of flow of patients, and I think there's an even a recent evidence that showed that it doesn't change anything. The worry is only if you want to intubate no, the patient in case he crashed. Uh, for my practice, I never keep the patient in PO, not even a single one hour. I just take them as they as they are. And I don't know about uh, Dr. Hanna, yeah, how, how you know, I totally agree, Dr. Khaled, because the sickest patients, like the ones for primary PCI, for coming and are being rushed from the street, are never NPO, right? So you have a patient who's coming for a primary PCI who's just been eating a whole uh, uh, dikrumi, you know, he's been eating and, <laughs> you know, and has been smoking and has been drinking and, you know, so, and we take them, whatever happens, we take them. So we, and also the very fragile patients, the very fragile patients with bad kidney functions, you can't really dehydrate them. So why torture the others? I mean, and we do have, like you said, very now elegantly, we do have data that nobody really needs to fast more than two hours for food if it's elective and, you know, they can drink. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so is my slides uh, up? Uh, you see them, guys? Hmm? No. I, I shared my screen. I'm going to share them again. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can we go presentation? Yeah, we can see it now. We can see it. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about the medical part of the vascular access. Mohammed talked a little bit about some of the nursing, which is a very pivotal of, of a flow, a smooth flow of patients uh, coming to the cath lab. The pre is as important as the procedure itself, as important as the post care, so that the patient is safe and getting the best experience that can he have in the cath lab. Um, my outline is just to compare between the two major accesses that we use, although nowadays there is a luxury, and as Dr. Rani said, uh, being an interventionalist doing complex PCI and CTO intervention, you have to really know your alternative access, not just the regular ra radial and femoral. There is the ulnar artery that you can use. There is the brachial artery for extreme cases where you don't have radials or ulnars. There is now big fan of, uh, uh, from Europe, there is, uh, coming the distal left radial, which is used for the left side for ergonomy, if you're using biradial axis, which I've been using for many of my CTO intervention to avoid puncturing the femoral. And uh, the radial does actually take uh, large size uh, sheets, uh, up to seven. And even if it's a male and big male, you can even insert 
a sheet inside a radial artery if it was large enough. Uh, there is other axes that are not relevant to today's talk, like auxiliary and brachial axis we've been using for TAVIs and uh, impellers insertion. It follows the same as the uh, femoral in terms of how do you manage uh, their post care by closing them using the suture based uh, or blood based uh, technology for vascular closure like angioseal and percolose. Uh, I usually like to start any topic that I present about history because if you don't know your past, you don't know your future. Uh, here's just a, a quick timeline of how it all began. And not a lot of people know that some actually, that the beginning of uh, coronaries or angiograms and doing, uh, reaching the aorta was through the radial. And it was uh, then shied away to the femoral because of equipment. Mainly when, when all developed, they didn't have the good, equip the good equipment and technology that we have now, where the, they are smaller, more sophisticated, and they can tolerate a lot, and they are hydrophilic that can slip into any vessel without uh, the patient feeling it even. Uh, so uh, it, it started at transradial, then all became, went back to femoral. And uh, Charles Dosser, he was an interventional radiologist, he was the first to do an unselective angiogram by doing an, an orthogram showing that the coronary treats. Then Dr. Mason uh, did his first selective, and it was totally by a coincidence, uh, where he was doing an LV uh, gram and then pulled out the catheter and it selectively intubated the right. And they know because in the old days, they used different type of uh, hyper or smaller contrast that any selective V fab arrest, and exactly that's it, it. was in one of his books actually. He wrote exactly the scenario that what happened exactly that after he pulled the catheter, with where we usually you blame the fellow for doing that, and they actually he was ready to shock the patient. He he grabs the paddles and put it in the patient to shock him, in anticipation to the picture seeing in in, in your left showing the first ever selective right coronary uh, angiogram. But it went well and it proved that you can do it safely and uh, without any complication. And of course, after the development of a better contrast agent, this is not more an issue. Then uh, Rockets and Abrams had the first selective coronary angiograms done by the femoral approach. Then Judkins developed his catheters. I myself are a Judkins guy. I think you can do everything from the right radial using a selective coronary angiogram. Some people use multi-purpose catheter for the right and left. Some use the multi-catheter multi that is engaging, the, like the tiger engaging the left and the right at one instance. Uh, and here's a picture of uh, Judkins with his catheters. Then Grutzing was the father of PCI. He, he did the first angioplasty that transformed our belief that nothing can be done percutaneously. And it did prove, uh, and actually there was a picture of his, one of his first patients that underwent the POBA, uh, just a balloon angioplasty of his LED that remained patent after 10 years, where uh, it's actually in a New England Journal of Medicine paper where the picture showed the pre and post and the, two, uh, the 10, 10 years difference of uh, angiogram that did not have any restenosis remarkably. And this is the picture with his first post preaching this uh, technology to the people in, uh, in the US and, and in Georgia, I believe, where he practiced his interventional cardiology. He was doing a lot of uh, these courses. And many of my senior uh, interventionists who taught me in Canada were actually among the audience. And they were the father of uh, modern interventional cardiology. Then, which was again in, in an institution where I was trained, Dr. Cambu from, uh, from, uh, from Montreal Heart Institute at uh, Montreal. He re brought back the radial access to the market and uh, he proved that it can be done safely in, in, in his paper, that it can be even good for the patient comfort. However, although it was published in the uh, late 80s, nobody uh, took that uh, approach seriously and uh, as a default. And now myself as a, 
as a young interventional cardiologist, do 90 to 10 percent of my 90 percent of my procedures through the radials, 10 percent femoral if needed. And I believe even all the and more senior generation like uh, Dr. Hani, they used to do 100 percent femoral, and now their practice adapting to the new guidelines and the new uh, wave of of uh, evidence that radial is much better for the patients in terms of safety, in terms of comfort, and uh, even uh, in terms of outcome to the patient, that, uh, that, that it does improve outcomes of certain procedures and prevent complications that might hinder a successful procedure unsuccessful. But then what happened is, is that it stayed quiet for a few years and then the, who resurrected again is was Dr. Kemenji from Europe who did his first PCI and he was actually pushed to do it. And that's usually where invention happens. When you are cornered at a corner and then you have to do something that no one can do and you prove uh, that it can be done safely and effectively. The reason is he was doing it, uh, he did it uh, because in his hospital uh, they did uh, find that because major, the majority of his patients were on anticoagulation like comedin and they are receiving the GP23 inhibitor post thrombolytics, they got the KPI of that hospital with increasing rate of bleeding, increasing rate of mortality from the femoral axis. And uh, to the degree that the hospital told him that we're going to close the PCI program because of these complications. And for that, he was reading the papers and he said it himself in, in one uh, interview that he was just scrambling through all the papers and he found the, Dr. Kambu's papers and it was like a message from heaven that, wow, that's something I should try to try to save my program from, from being shut down by the administration. And indeed, he did it. He, he did it very effectively. And that pushed the industry uh, to, to, to come up with better sheets, better guiding catheters, better uh, equipment facilitating the need for us interventionalists and for the comfort of the patient to have better equipment that we can be used transradially. And that's obviously with advancement of technology. As, as I mentioned, uh, as, and as Dr. Hani mentioned, uh, you as a young interventionalist, you have to learn alternative access. The reason is if you wanna do biradial, one procedure I did th three access to visualize a CTO. So you really have to know how to use them and how to get uh, different access if the patient has an occluded radials. You have the ulnar if you want to try it. You have the left hand. You have the brachials. And the subclavian sometimes uh, can be used. We've used this in many cases of cavi and also. So for the radials, I'm going to go across quickly the anatomy, what access techniques are there, and complication and challenges we face as interventionists, as technicians doing the procedure. The radial artery is a decent size and it can take up a six French. As you see here in the pictures, comparing it to the femoral uh, in a regular man. And uh, that actually gives you also a hint why patients have uh, spasms from radial artery because there is a uh, circumferential touching of the walls which induces spasm to these patients. And lucky for us that the, the hands receives a lot of blood supply from two different arteries preventing, even if this occluded, dissected, thrombosed, you're still gonna have a good hand uh, blood flow coming from the ulnar and or the interosseous. I've seen cases where there is bilateral occlusion of the radial and the ulnar, and yet there's no limb ischemia. I'm not advocating to do bilateral. I know people have done it in the past. They used radial and ulnar punctures. I usually prefer not to puncture the same arm. I puncture the other arm. Uh, but they've proven that even with that, you don't have limb ischemia. This is a limb ischemia because it's very highly vascular and there is a lot of collateral with the palmal arch and the interosseous artery. The advantages, as we all know, it's superficial course, so it's easy to puncture. The learning curve is very quick and easy. Easy homeostasis because you can compress it. And that's an advantage of the radial over the uh, ulnar because the ulnar is floating on a fat pad. So it's really harder to, to, to establish a homeostasis uh, compared to radial. Um, uh, the incidence of vascular complication is low, but it's there. And uh, it's getting lower and lower as we all getting 
more radials and we know how to deal with radials and their, uh, their uh, uh, small company. And the most important advantage is uh, I see is early mobilization of the patient. I hate, when I round on patient, I hate when I see the patient on the bed. I usually ask the nurses to, to allow the patient that can be mobilized so I can see them in the chair because the chair meaning one step away from being discharged. And this is even economically, uh, having a patient come in the morning and being discharged at five o'clock, you don't have to hire a team to stay at night for overnight stay of a patient coming for ephemeral or for uh, longer duration. So it's actually a transformation of economic reasons that even the states which were initially resistant to adapt to the radial uh, access as, as a default access because of economical reason that they will lose a lot of jobs for these nurses that stay with the patient at night. But in the other hand, uh, having a day, day cat lab makes uh, the flow better and makes even the outcome of uh, 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 the financial outcome to the institution much better. The, the usual checklist that I have in my mind, which can be even added uh, to, to any body list, is the size and the strength of the puzzle. I usually, before I, I ch choose the axis, I go feel the pulse. The strength and the size is a very important factor to decide. As I mentioned to you earlier, uh, I've done cases where I inserted seven, eight French sheet in, in, in the radials successfully in a big guy where it was able to accommodate that sheet. The reason is we have better technology. The, uh, the, there is companies that have sheets that are six French, but they can take a seven French guiding catheter in it. Uh, however, you have to be careful with kinking because it kink easily. Uh, so when you insert it, you have to be gentle and you have to apply gentle care because it can actually kink easily. And I don't advocate using this company uh, for the distal rift radial because uh, almost always in the distal rift radial, you always will, have, will end up with a kink. So use the one that has a braid for better support and kink resistance. Allen test and modify Allen test. I personally don't do it. Some people do it. There's some evidence for uh, with doing it and against doing it. I don't believe that any modern interventionist does it routinely. Um, and uh, does this patient need his arm for future dialysis? It, it's a factor, but not a major factor because most dialysis catheters are in the left arm. However, I usually ask the patient if, if the patient has a CKD, if he will have, or there is a planned surgery for this. I might, although it never happened to me that I lose the femoral on that basis. But what I find it also intriguing is, which been also publicized in the, in the news, is the choosing the access for someone with an important profession that has his hands, uh, plays an important role in his profession like musicians, interventional cardiologists, surgeons, and even uh, political leaders. And uh, I do still believe that the radial is safe and it shouldn't impact your choice. Like a patient profession or his level of uh, famousness should not change your decision to do access. However, you should inform the patient, which is which are all interventionalists or any procedure uh, uh, specialty, you sit with the patient and you do inform consent, telling them about the complication and the alternative, and the patient has the right to choose. Uh, if, he, if he doesn't want to have a radial access, to use the alternative access, which is not favorable to most interventionists nowadays, unless they have to go there, uh, to use the femoral. So a discussion with the patient himself about choosing the right access for him is also important. This is a real example of modified Allen test. What we do now uh, in, in, in the cath lab is use the pulse oximeter because it's faster. It's, it doesn't take two minutes that you have to wait for to, uh, to diminish the blood flow. So what you do is you compress both radial and unknown and you ask the patient to make a fist up and down so you drain all the blood until it's completely pale. And then you, you relieve the pressure from the ulnar and see if the flush of blood coming to the palm completely uh, pink. In 10 minutes, that's the normal list. In 10 minutes, 10 to 15, it's mildly abnormal. More than 20 is abnormal. And you, they say in the old days, don't do a radial access because there is no good collateral if you don't see a complete blushing of the palm. 
there is a, an easier, faster, and quicker test where you do apply the pulse oximeter with the waveform on the screen, on the thumb, and then you compress the radial only, and you see what happens to the waveform. If it stayed the same after two minutes, it is type A, type B, initially it will be dampened, but then the augmentation of collaterals will make it regular, so it will go back to normal. And then C, which completely obliterated, and then you see dampened uh, pulse oximeter wave. Uh, all A, B, and C are okay to go for radial axis. Again, I don't do them, so I'm blinded. So I, I, even if it's a C, I do it. Even if I have the pre-knowledge of having the patient have a C, I know it. I would go ahead and do it. However, I'll do some precaution, which I'm going to come back in, 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 in the next few slides. Type D is where there is complete obliteration and two minutes in, there is no evidence of good collaterals and the blood uh, or the pulse oximeter is still blunted with negative uh, waveform. Some people advocated studies that it increases the uh, capillary lactate, indicating that there is ischemia when there is an abnormal Allen test. Again, there is no evidence that you will lose your limb if you have a type C, uh, sorry, type D, or if you have an abnormal uh, Allen test that you will have worse outcome. So my default, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have the opinion of Dr. Hani at the end, if, if he does it in his practice, I'm sure he does a lot of volume, that uh, did this change his uh, a choice of access if the patient has an abnormally long uh, Allen test or uh, waveform. The usual way, which, which is more technical for interventionists, so I'm gonna go quickly, it's either anterior puncture or transfix and then withdraw and insert the wire. Uh, both are good, both are equally uh, successful. You just, what you're comfortable with. Uh, most of the wounds I've seen, they, which is transfixing the artery and then withdrawing the angiocap. And when you see blood flow, then the wire. The most important thing is uh, for the patient comfort, you have to numb. And I, what I've seen also from my fellows that they do give a lot of xylocaine, which distort the anatomy of uh, the area in the, in the forearm. Uh, I wouldn't give a lot. What you need is just a simple stick of maybe 0.5 of xylocaine. Uh, and I usually squeeze it and massage it for a minute before. So it disturbed, uh, distribu get distributed in, in, in the subcutaneous area around the artery. And once you feel the artery, you just go slowly. I use the anterior technique, uh, the Seldinger technique, and almost always you get it from the first shot. They did a study even, as, as always in cardiology, whenever we have a question, we do a study. There's a billion study about everything. Um, what you can see here that both techniques are safe, both techniques are fast. However, when you fail the first technique, doing the second technique might increase your success rate. What's complication to see and anticipate? This is very important for nurses and technicians because they are the one in the front line waiting in the post care seeing these to alert us, to inform us uh, about it, and to, to know that this patient is developing. What to look for is a hematoma. It's either improper pressure from the TR band, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. You don't have to compress it too hard to occlude the vessel and not to lose so a hematoma. You have to have that fine sweet spot or sweet pressure uh, to maintain uh, a radial patency, because actually doing this technique it's called patent hemostasis will maintain your radial axis. And there's evidence that this, doing this, patent hemostasis will prevent or decrease the rate of radial artery occlusion, which is the worst thing that can happen. Because, you no, know, the PCI, although it's a good intervention, however, the need for re-intervention is high. So the patient who had the procedure will eventually might have future procedure, uh, either due to failure of uh, our stenting or due to progression of disease that need pre-intervention. So uh, always try to avoid radial artery occlusion if it happens. And, uh, and doing this techniques prevent the radial artery from occlusion. And we'll come across also a few uh, tips to maintain the right. So patent hemostasis. So you apply the TR pan to a pressure that prevent the hematoma from forming, but yet have a pulse and have a, a flow in that artery to prevent the occlusion from happening. 
Deception can happen, especially if you're rough with the wires. You have to be gentle with the wires, with, the, with everything that you pass through the radials, because dissection can happen and can hinder your access uh, a failure, and then you will not have a smooth procedure. Because Dr. Hani mentioned that the access is actually the most important part of a procedure. A complex even procedure will make it even higher success rate. Because if you start with a bad access, you will have a nightmare. The procedure itself might be easy, but then dealing with the access actually might kill the patient. So uh, pay attention to the access as important to the procedure itself. Thrombosis is the, it's the, it's the most common complication that can happen. And usually it's late, not acute. It happens in the few weeks to months after the procedure. From, in reported registry, it's from eight to 10. I believe it was higher in the past, but now having uh, adapting the new te techniques and preventing that from happening, make it less and less. In my practice, I think it's around five to 10% range. Infection is extremely rare, unless you're reusing substances or uh, you're not doing uh, what Muhammad uh, uh, have instructed in the pre-care, which is clear with the hexidine, is very important to prevent and reduce infection. Pseudoaneurysm is also a complication that can be avoidable, and there's a picture of it down, where you can see that the hematoma itself will form a shell, and then this expands over time. I see this happening to patients with on, on oral anticoagulation. When they're pre prematurely, the TR hand is taking out, and they resume their anticoagulation maybe at night, and they don't feel, and they don't apply whatever recommendation we tell them not moving the hand aggressively in the next few days. And that where it pops the clot and then it forms a, a pseudoaneurysm. So these patients, uh, the chronic renal failure patient, patient on anticoagulation, I usually do have a follow-up call. And I ask them about the uh, religious uh, strict rules about how to take care of their access because I don't want them to come with a radial aneurysm where it almost always can be resolved compression, buccal intervention, and ligation. AV fistula is extremely rare. Retroperitoneal bleed related to the access itself is zero uh, percent. However, a spontaneous retroperitoneal bleed can happen. So if the patient is hypotensive after a uh, procedure, you should not just say retroperitoneal bleed is not on the table. You should always think of it as a complication of any access that can happen due to anticoagulation. The challenges we see, and quickly I'm gonna go across them and how to troubleshoot them, spasm. Spasm was a major, major issue to radial access. And that maybe got a lot of older generation interventionalists uh, shying away from adapting this as their default because the spasm is very frequent and it's avoidable and you can manage uh, your procedure without uh, choosing alternative access. Uh, uh, this starts with the patient himself. Sedation is a very important, crucial point of uh, prevention of spasm and even treating spasm. So you have to make sure that the patient is comfortable, especially anxious patients, especially females, uh, with small arteries, they are more sensitive than male. Uh, giving them uh, pre-medication of sedation, fentanyl and midazolam is very important. It's not only for the anxiety of the patient, it's to prevent spasm itself. The use of hydrophilic sheath, I was trained in the area of transition because that cath lab has, our cath lab initially was ha having the non-hydrophilic, then we transitioned into hydrophilic sheath, and you see the amazing transition. It's easy to insert, easy to take out the hydrophilic the, uh, the, compared to the hydro or the plastic that is not coated with hydrophilic uh, substance that makes it smooth. In the, in the, in the, in the yeah, one of the disadvantages of having hydrophilic sheath is that it slips easily. So you have to pay attention. What I do is I apply a tegaderm with a hole in it to fix it in, in the, in the, with the arm to prevent the sheath from moving, especially when you exchange equipment. Uh, pharma pharmacological cocktail, it's default in almost all the cath labs I worked with to give uh, an NTG uh, with verapamil. That's my cocktail, a 200 and 2.5. And sometimes I give five of verapamil if the blood pressure allows. Uh, some people give the uh, deltaism. Different cath labs have different recipe, but I almost always, I give it and you should always give it because that facilitates, and there is proof that it facilitates the radial access 
and prevent spasm, sorry. And in severe cases, which I'm sure that not all of labs have it, the papaverin and uh, milsodamine, which is direct myolaxin, have been used, and it did show that it prevents spasm. The best cocktail, uh, again, I'm using it from a study of 200, and uh, it does reduce the incidence of uh, vasospasm of the radial artery. Radial artery occlusion, we came across of it, and one of the important point in, in prevention of radial artery occlusion is the uh, after removing the sheath you do the patent hemostasis which i explained to you and maybe muhammad will come across in the post care also the use of unfractionated heparin even if the patient is on a therapeutic inr let's say that it's an emergency and the patient had a STEMI and his inr was therapeutic i would still give unfractionated heparin uh, the usual is uh, uh, 50 units per kg but my usual is for small ladies from 3,000 to 4,000, big guys from five to 6,000 of units. It doesn't matter if you give it intra-arterial or, or if you give it, uh, or you give it intravenous. I almost give it all intravenous. The reason is because it's uh, acidic a little bit. So the patient, uh, it can induce spasm. So, and it's uncomfortable for the patient. So I never, almost never give it in, in the sheath itself. Uh, different people get, do it differently. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. Uh, it's just for the comfort. What I noticed that when injected in the arterial sheath, they feel the pain and it gets spastic. Plus, I don't give the, the uh, heparin until I cross the arch. Because once in some cases where you don't have uh, the, you can't cross the arch due to tortuosity or occlusion where you have to convert to femoral, Having not giving the heparin is a good idea because it will limit your femoral complication if you stick high or if you have a multiple stick into the femoral, the complication from the femoral axis. And this is the study that did show that giving a heparin will prevent radial artery occlusion. In their study, up to 25% did have radial artery occlusion with uh, uh, giving a uh, percent almost have radial artery occlusion when the heparin was not given, even for a diagnostic procedure, you give heparin. And uh, even if it was forgotten to be given at the beginning of the procedure, you give it at the end of the procedure. It's okay. Actually, in the study, they, uh, and I think in Mayo Clinic, they do give it at the end of the procedure, rather a diagnostic procedure, rather than at the beginning where uh, it's our practice. And this incidence has reduced to 4.3% in their study, uh, when, the, when they proved that giving heparin reduced radial artery occlusion. The loops is also challenging uh, to, to interventionalists. However, you can tackle them with multiple techniques uh, uh, before you choose to go into a different axis. Uh, you, you can change, you can actually try to twist it over the arm if it was uh, somewhere superficial. And uh, you can untwist. You can see that the loop was uh, untwisted and became straight with using the sheath itself, the strength of the sheath. Uh, torqueability, uh, yes, it's a challenge uh, to, to get the radial training. Uh, maybe it was a challenge for the older interventionalist because they are practiced uh, femoralist. Uh, and then having a new technology coming in, and it's not only new, it's only difficult too, because you can see here in the right radial, which is the most default uh, intervention in the radial area, that there is two points of friction that can make the, Uh, the, the, it's a two friction point that makes it resistant to and difficult and kink, uh, especially if it's a guiding catheter. The 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 is thin. Kinking is is terrible. And if it happened, you have to recognize it first, and you have to manage it appropriately. Or you'll have a one-hour procedure turns into a four-hour procedure. And this is due. Uh, this is why the radial it wasn't a favor. Uh, access for some old interventionalist because it, it required the learning and, uh, it's only one friction point that uh, make it easier for manipulation of the guide manipulation and in selecting the intubation of the radial art uh, of the coronary uh, going south now to the femoral 
the femoral is important. Some people are really cult, like a radialist cult. They, by foot and stones, by stick and stone, they are radialist. They don't want to do any other axis. This is wrong. You should have an open mind. You shouldn't be dogmatic about axis over the other. You should do know and to maintain skills. Although this is not major issue because it was uh, debunked because initially there was an issue called uh, the radial paradox where uh, there were data showing that people who are trained radialist and then transform into femoral, this was associated with worse outcome to the patient because they tend to have more complication from the femoral because they're not used to do it. However, this was being uh, debunked in multiple registries uh, and studies from the UK and the US that having the practice as radial with maintaining a few numbers of selective cases femoral uh, does not make you in that radial paradox or barfu paradox. Uh, it's actually safe to practice radially. However, you have to maintain your skills for the femoral because you need the femoral for TAVI. You need the femoral for large pore access. For procedures like uh, impels insertion, uh, so you have to maintain a healthy, safe hashtag safe femoral uh, rather than the radial. The access technique I'm going to come across and complication, and I just came across about the femoralist and radialist because there was even in Twitter's where I'm active and Dr. Hanis too. There's a big war between initially maybe three or four years ago where there's a big war between the femoral and radialist people. You don't have to be dogmatic. You don't choose a side, choose what's best for the patient and what makes the patient's outcome better. It's a bigger artery, easier to stick. However, you have to respect it because with this, people die. There is evidence that sticking too high above the inguinal ligament, i.e. the parallel to the inferior digastric, uh, makes uh, a very fatal complication, a retroperitoneal bleed. If it was identified, then we can save the patient. If it wasn't, then it can kill the patient in, uh, at the middle of the night upstairs in the, in the uh, suite where his blood pressure was checked and then he died from shock and bleeding into his abdomen. So that's why you should really respect the femoral. Femoral, it's a sweet spot that you should aim and target. It's between the inferior epigastric artery, IEE, IEA, and the bifurcation. This is where you want to poke. However, we're not created equal in terms of anatomy variation. Some have higher bifurcation. Some do have very low bifurcation. What's important for me and what I always teach my fellow and what I practice in my practice, almost always avoid a high stick by all costs because that's what kills the patient. Having a low stick, yes, it's bothersome. It might create a complication, but rarely it will kill a patient. Having a high stick, I've seen a lot of and juice from my friends and colleagues of a stick that is almost transabdominal, like it's almost above and beyond the inferior plastic. It's almost always, you can't close it, you can't compress it. You have to come across from the contralateral axis with a balloon occlusion, and that's the only safe way of doing it. I know people have done it with compression, but it's by luck or by, by heaven giving blessing to that patient from bleeding into his abdomen. If there is a high stick, it's almost always, I always cross from the contralateral side with a balloon and balloon occlusion is only by default. People have used a closure device, which I don't advocate because the closure device, especially the angioseal, will not tug the, the uh, collagen plug with the, with the sponge. It will stay, there, was, there will be a space in between, especially if it was deep down in the pelvic. How, uh, wh why inferior bigastric is important to know in your angiogram before you start the procedure. I always do, whenever there is a femoral axis that I do, either I chose it or it was an alternative, I always do an, an angiogram. Show the inferior bigastric entry because the deflection of the inferior bigastric is where it's the inguinal, it's, it's, it's a landmark of the inguinal uh, uh, ligament, i.e. the last area you can compress is here. That's why any stick is above, you can't compress it. Especially in obese patients where they have Many layers of fat where they have pseudo groin, you can know where, where there is groin uh, because of the fold of abdomen. Uh, I advocate for using of ultrasound. And almost, uh, it's a standard of care now in some, some many, so many uh, cath labs 
that you should not do a femoral puncture without the use of ultrasound, i.e. to recognize the bifurcation and to know the size and to know the anterior surface where you will choose your closure device. Because if you stick a calcium where you can avoid it by just tilting the needle, sometimes you can't close it using per close or running GCM. So this is very important. Um, the idea that uh, why we puncture this and at the mid of the femoral head, that uh, it's called the cumulative target zone because in a study showed that at least above 60% of the population have their bifurcation below this, i.e. hitting the common femoral artery, which is the golden spot for any intervention to be done. Uh, there is technique which can only be taught in the cath lab, but I use hand service anatomy, ultrasound, and floral. The combination of all is the best in my own uh, opinion. Uh, however, whatever you're comfortable with, you can do, however, you have to do it safely. Uh, there is a lot of uh, people advocating for the use of micropuncture. It is actually the default way in using it for upgrading it into, uh, into a large pore like TAVI or Impella to start with a micropuncture because it's a, uh, the, and not only the micropuncture itself, I have a picture for it here. Uh, it comes with a small 0.18 wire, a 21 uh, needle, and the she there is a sheath and a dilator. I usually do my angios for the, when I use the micropuncture, using the dilator itself with a syringe with contrast, pure contrast or 50-50 contrast. I connect the dilator, which is equals to three French. So it is easy to compress. And even if you stick too low, you can just stop and compress a little bit and then you, re you restick high. So use the dilator, not the sheath, because the sheath is big and it reaches up to, up to 4 to 4.5 trench. Uh, another Poorsman technique is if you don't have this, because it's expensive and it can add to the cost, uh, you can use the 4 French dilator, which is available in almost all cath lab, as an alternative to your micropuncture. It will give you an equivalent to uh, when you use the micropuncture. Uh, 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 puncture uh, sheet itself, not the dilator, because the dilator is one French slower than uh, the sheet. And in, in one study compared, but this study was uh, problematic, they compared using the micropuncture without using the micropuncture. Uh, the reason is that uh, and if you are trained to use the micropuncture, micropuncture wire can go everywhere, can go into small branch. So you have to advance your micropuncture wire over floral, seeing that it goes into the internal iliac, then you advance your sheath and do the angiogram. Because blind doing of that can you can go into a small sub branch of, uh, of of the common femoral and then uh, end up with a complication complication of femoral it's uh, again what kills patient what makes their trip to the cath lab uh, a disaster is sticking too high so always stick low that's my 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 teaching to the fellows and juniors attending please stick too low no one will complain you if you have a pseudo and than high and killing the patient, especially if the patient is an anticoagulation GB23 inhibitor or have received thrombolytic recently. If you are in a center where there is ultrasound, bring it to the cath lab, use the ultrasound to prevent these complications. Uh, hematoma is the most common complication that can happen, uh, two to five percent. And this is mainly related to the post care, which Mohammed will talk about. So apply a good compression uh, to, the, to the common femoral. Uh, would limit this complication from happening. Again, the patient on anticoagulation, the patient who have CKD or platelet dysfunction, I usually instruct them to stay longer in bed, not the usual four hour longer. And I usually check the wound myself because these patients will have the complication because they will restart their anticoagulants and they move. And importantly, you have to ask the patient about not moving. A lot of patients don't get that part and they move and they move the clot and, and then uh, hematoma, pseudoaneurysm, or AV vestula. AV vestula can happen because if you transfix a vein over the artery, that's why when you do ultrasound, you see the vein next to the artery because in some anatomies I've seen where in some area, the vein is on top of the artery almost always, where you have to do a side stick to prevent the sticking the vein and preventing the AV vestula from happening. Infection is important. Some people advocate for even sterile technique when removing the sheath. 
I usually do it with the non-sterile gloves, compressing with a sterile gauze. Thrombosis, it's, it's almost never gonna happen because it's a big vessel with a big flow, unless the patient has pre-conditioned the stenosis or pre-conditioned uh, the problematic with thrombosis. But as a usual, it's extremely rare. But what worries me and what makes every interventionist worries is the retroperitoneal bleed. I think I'm gonna stop here because the rest is just gonna radial versus femoral and femoral uh, radial winds in terms of patient comfort, in terms of outcome, and in terms of prevention of mortality. And it's actually made it to the guidelines. Uh, uh, the Americans, because they are a little, a little bit hesitant to change their guidelines based on new evidence. It's a class 2A. I believe in the most recent, it remained class 2A uh, as a default access for intervention. Again, there is a lot of politics in it, so maybe that's why it didn't reach the class 1 indication as per the, America, uh, the European guideline. It's a class 1 uh, evidence A that using the femoral, uh, the radial is uh, and should be your default access. Uh, and by this, I end up my talk and will be more than welcome to ask any questions, or maybe you can proceed to Muhammad's talk, and then we'll have the questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was really comprehensive. Uh, it was excellent, uh, and I found it very useful. Um, there are uh, several comments on the Allen's test. I think you covered that really well. And I think most people now, it's not in the guidelines anymore. Um, because it's a very harmless test, uh, some people still do it. And it only takes a few minutes using the pulse oximeter. So yeah, I think it's left to everybody's practice. But you do not have to do it. You do not have to do it. Um, may, unless the patient is giving you some history which makes you uh, suspicious. Uh, my question to you quickly before we move on. Uh, in the complications of the radial, uh, I noticed you did not mention the compartment syndrome. Uh, or did, did you mention it and I missed it? Actually, it's uh, in, in the addition of this uh, uh, compartment syndrome as a complication of hematoma formation. It's a, it's a, it's okay. a devastating uh, uh, complication and it can happen. And uh, knowing uh, recognition is the most important part of compartment because you can save the patient's limb if it happens. And uh, usually what happens is the loss of sensation as initial uh, presentation to that, then the loss of pulse. So uh, it's very important for the nurse to be aware of that. It's again important, maybe I missed the slide, but yes, it does have a very important uh, follow-up. Usually the nursing part that pick it up I remember one, actually, I was working in a charity work in, in Niger where we don't have post care. And uh, at the end of the day, when we rounded the patient, we had a patient that his hand looked like Popeye's hand from the amount of hematoma that formed yeah. there. And uh, believe it or not, that patient, uh, we didn't have vascular surgery, or of surgery, one strength to do fasciotomy. So it was only prayers and crossing my hands and I used the uh, gauze, wrapped it at a, at a pressure, at a high pressure, and thank God it didn't, not, no complication happened. It resolved completely the next day. I was lucky. Excellent, uh, it, yeah. It's completely avoidable by recognition because if you notice that from happening, uh, you just apply a cuff uh, or the sphygmomanometer for a 10 or 15, um, millimeter of mercury uh, below the systolic to prevent the, uh, the evolution of, uh, of, uh, of the hematoma. And if you have the luxury of having plastic surgery or orthopedic, they can come and do intracatheter pressure and then decide if the patient needs an urgent surgery or not. Thank you very much. Uh, one more point is uh, the spasm. There's something about the spasm uh, which it, it tends to disappear after you do more cases. So once the team has really done a lot of cases, like over a thousand cases, they don't get to see spasm anymore. I mean, uh, you know, after, I, I really, since we crossed the thousand cases uh, together as a team, we stopped seeing spasm. I, 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 at the beginning when I started, I was getting spasm very frequently and I thought, maybe the Egyptian patients have a problem, but it's not true, the problem was me. 
you know, I was nervous. I was making the patient nervous. Uh, but it, it, for some reason, with the new equipment, also downgrading to five French and four French for the diagnostic is very good to avoid spasm. Yeah. Thank you very much. These were wonderful presentations. Um, so you. how do you want the flow to go? Can, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Meher Zeki, who joined us. Um, it's really nice to have you. The picture we have doesn't have a beard, but the beard looks very nice. Um, um, uh, you're welcome. Mr. Maher Zeki is uh, the operations director and director of the cath lab at the Royal Heart Health uh, Hospital in Abu Dhabi, in the UAE. Um, and he's very experienced and, uh, you know, we're also looking forward to uh, his contribution today. Mohammed, would you like to um, say something? about the streaming, how are we gonna, the next well, presentation? I'm, that's it, I'm gonna just finish up with the postcare now. And just to tell you guys that Amahir is one of the creators of PAC meeting, one of the scientific committee, with, as well as Mr. Bandar Haddad. So Amahir has a big impact on all of my nurse technician meeting here in the Gulf. So Amahir, good to see you again, my friend. Thank you, Muhammad. I, I would like to, to welcome uh, all the teams and to thank Dr. Khalid for the very nice presentation. Uh, actually, I was having some questions for you, Dr. Khalid, if you don't mind. Uh, it will help more in the nurse's part. So, uh, um, usually, Doctor, if you have uh, ST elevation in my acute, acute coronary syndrome case, so do you prefer to go still radial or you like to go femoral at this time, at this case? Def definitely radial. It's actually been shown that it reduces more uh, morbidity and reduces complication. I prefer to go radial, even in cardiogenic shock. And maybe even Dr. Rouhani can even give his input from his experience. Uh, it's definitely my default, even in cardiogenic shock. I go femoral, uh, radial, uh, so because it will save there. the femoral for something bigger that I might use, like in Pella or anything. Sure all, uh, Dr. Rouhani, what's, uh, what's your take on that? Yes, I totally agree, actually. I, I um, go radial in the sickest of patients. Um, I, will not, I will only not go radial in a patient who's like uh, moving his hands uh, or, or somebody I need to, um, you know, like some, sometimes some of the patients on ventilators uh, where I don't have very good anesthesia support, I might go femoral. But I fear for the bleeding more from the, those very sick patients. And the thing about the radial artery is that even if you don't feel it, you're going to stick it. I actually, Dr. Khaled touched uh, very briefly on ultrasound, but I'm actually very fond of ultrasound guided access. And I think if you use ultrasound guided access in 100% of all your cases, you will not agree to, uh, to uh, go without ultrasound. Even in the distal radial, uh, Dr. Kimene, the Dutch uh, person that Dr. Khaled alluded to, has come up with a new uh, the snuff box uh, access, which I've used a couple of times. Uh, and with ultrasound, uh, you can avoid a lot of problems. Actually, it's a very good idea for cath lab techs and nurses to learn how to do the ultrasound, because a lot of the doctors don't know how to do it. And if you learn how to do it, you're going to make yourself a huge asset to your cath lab. An ultrasound uh, takes two minutes. It shows you exactly how to stick the anterior wall. It shows you the size of the artery. It shows you the flow of the artery. If the artery is occluded, you're going to see it. If the artery is femoral, under a very fatty person when you can't feel the pulse well, you will see the bifurcation that Dr. Khaled put the, in the drawing and you will be able to stick in exactly the right position unless you want to use, of course, X-ray and, uh, and anatomical landmarks. But using ultrasound is something that we should all learn, techs, uh, nurses, and physicians. And it's easy. Any, any uh, ultrasound tech in, in the Gulf or in Saudi Arabia can teach you, you know. Because you're not going to do a whole full ultrasound. It's just to look at the thing before you stick. Uh, yes, I, I will go with radial uh, in STEMI, in primary PCIs. These are the patients who need it most. Yeah, great. So my, my, my uh, second comment, um, the early mobilization of the patients if we do radial. 
actually days ago, weeks ago, I was discussing with Muhammad if we can do something regarding this matter, that we discharge the patients on the same day, uh, no matter if it is diagnostic or intervention, stable intervention, stable BCI, if they can go home. So do you advise this, this uh, step or not? Um, shall I start? Shall I answer? Yes, yes go ahead. Okay. Actually, there is a whole um, sheet for same day discharge. It's called SDD, same day discharge. So same day discharge, to be able to discharge the patient on the same day, it better be radial, but even ephemeral, which is done very early in the morning, you can probably send them home at night. Uh, the patient should have had no complications uh, before discharge. The procedure which is done should either be a diagnostic or a non-complex intervention. So for instance, if the patient had had left main PCI, or complex bifurcation PCI with a mini crash or one of those, uh, then uh, that does not qualify for same day discharge. The patient should have, ha should have been pre-medicated. The patient uh, should have access to their med medicines and should have had the medicines given to them in the uh, enough amount. The patient should have already started on rehab or already being spoken to by the anti-smoking cessation nurse, uh, or by people who tell them they're going to come again. And the patient needs to be within the catchment area of the hospital uh, in less than one hour to be back in the hospital. Also, the patient should not be living alone and should be able to take care of themselves. So I agree with you totally, but there is a whole sheet. I'll be happy to send it to Mohammed uh, yeah. with the requirements that you just tick for same-day discharge. Um, it's not just the access. I have sent many patients with femoral access home on the same day, but I do them at like nine in the morning, 10 in the morning, and then send them home after 12 hours. So six hours after the sheath is out, already they walk in the hospital for one hour. But of course with radial, we can send them home after four hours. Four hours and they're out, they're home. Actually, yeah. this is a very important question because during the COVID time, many patients, I do not want to stay in hostel, they're scared, and we do not want to keep them in hostel. Thank yes. you. It's actually, it's ex I exactly echo Dr. Uh, Han, and having an SDD checklist is important. And even for all the procedures I do the complex, the only people who I keep overnight are the retro cases, or when I suspect that there will be a perf that I, can, and I need to do echo later at the night. But the majority of patients can be safely discharged at the end of the day. Yeah, I think I think we'll work, me and Muhammad, to change some mentality of some operators who keep the patients even 24 or 48 hours. Some people they keep the patients. There is a reimbursement issue. Sometimes that's the, the main point. Yeah, if, if we yeah, go to the, the private point. business, yes. Mahri, come on, it's a surprise. Let's work on it first. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So I'll start, and I actually want to join this discussion, but I'll finish my part, and then because I have like now written my 10,000 question for everyone. So I'm just gonna go quickly about the post-cath uh, care. Now, once the patient has been uh, is done and everything, we want to remove the sheath. And depending on if it's radial or femoral, just a couple of things you have to keep in mind before removal the sheath, just make sure chest pain, any complication is done, we, the patient's sleep. Drug flow, you need to make sure the drug flows are okay. And if you are the recovery nurse or the ward nurses, Please don't accept the patient unless the, if, there is, if there's the patient has any issue like a chest pain or bleeding or hypotension or hypertension, just make sure your physician give you a clear order to receive the patient because it might need to be, uh, you might need to be tackled in the lab. So just make sure anticoagulation, new IV fluid has been uh, charted in the lab. Uh, on return to the ward, for example, uh, make sure that the physician specific for post catheterization order. And when am I saying specific, please make sure it's specific. Meaning, how many hours do you want the bed dresser, doctor? Uh, your, for radial, depending on uh, the order for the radial, for the radial band, if it's a balloon based or it's a pressure based. Make sure the guidelines and the forms have all been written. So, um, and try not to take the blood pressure from the same hand as the radial. What we used to do, 
We used to put the pulse oximeter on the head with the radial just to make sure everything is okay. And the pressure in the opposite. Assess patient pain, notify physician for an abnormality, maintain patient bed rest for six to eight hours depending on the procedure. So uh, position the patient accordingly. Now for a femoral site, depending on the policy, usually keep them like 30 degrees just to keep them a bit comfortable for their back. And that's the issue. And I'm telling you, I'm a, I'm a radial guy. My father had cast like 10, like almost uh, eight, nine times since 1980s up to the 2013. And he started fumaral. And when he switched to radial, like he said, Muhammad, where has this been all my life? So, yeah. So, and for radial, uh, patient could sit uh, uh, quite, each should be sitting. And uh, the most important thing that they mobilize, they can be even mobilized, they don't flex their wrist or anything for 24 hours. So for building a cure, you need to apply pressure regardless to what happened. So I'm just gonna go quickly to the radial sheath removal. Now, um, usually they use Tiarabad. This is one brand that's available in the market. It's a pressure base. One important thing about um, the radial band when you receive it from a company. Make sure you receive from them uh, the clear instruction of how to use it. During the past few years, uh, when I'm John Metronic and I've been doing education everywhere, the most key point that I found out that each hospital has a very strange, different type of um, policy for the radiant band. Like for example, if you look at this one, the, the TR band, it has a dot. The, look at the policies of the company exactly, teaching you it needs to be point, one point, uh, one point uh, the, the dot should be higher from the, uh, from the puncture side, for example. The other thing is when you inflate it, they go in like poof, 15 directly. That's actually completely wrong. So a couple of things you need to remember. You're usually putting the radial band in the cath lab. Your hand is dirty, you're the scrub nurse, Change your glove when you put the radio band. Well, the radio band is going to go outside with the patient, the nurses, the doctors, everyone, even the family member, they will be touching that band. So please change your gloves or do the proper hand uh, hygiene. This is something very important. Even the syringe. Guys, how many of you guys in the chat room remember that you received the, the, that uh, syringe in a bag and it's a bit bloody because I'm keeping it on the bag because it was a bit bloody? Why should it be? So uh, make sure that the chief, when you remove the sheath, you go according to the policy. So you start inflating, and just I'm not going to go through this like uh, step by step on the slide. Just prepare your gauze, prepare your everything, and when you're inflating your radial band, make sure that it's according to the patient. It's uh, uh, remember, regardless of the brand or regardless of the type of uh, regardless of the type of the radial band that you have. It's according to the patient. It's not according to the policy of the hospital. Meaning, you don't do 14 ml of uh, air in every patient. It depends on the patient. And less is better. You go according to the patient's uh, weight and height and uh, the way his hand is. So you inflate it, then you deflate it. When you see a drop of blood, you inflate it one ml more. You, know, you go to normal. It's not a hard uh, pressure uh, like, uh, like the fumarant. So very important uh, uh, that whenever you're doing anything like that, you have to be ready for vesivagal or anything. And now uh, just remember you have to keep your atropine ready or your saline ready or hemicell, your fluid. And depending on the policy, some, we used to do in the old days, we used to keep hemicell standby everywhere. But nowadays we've learned that giving a big dose of normal saline, it's actually as effective, uh, giving a crystalloid and colloid. And this is just quickly talking about it. So what we used to do in, for diagnostic cases, the air bubble will begin to inflate after 30 minutes cheese removal and remove every three ml. Again, according to the policy of your hospital, each hospital is different. For PCI, the air bubble will be, uh, begin to be deflated after 90 minutes or two hours from the cheese removal because depending on the amount of heparin they gave and uh, if the patient is on uh, a potent antiplatelet like abeximab or uh, uh, agrostat. So depending on your policy. So if bleeding does the cure, the air bladder is injected with TML of our uh, increment until homeostasis is achieved. Now, I always used to do something, always explain the patient, and this is the key point for good post-patient care. Talk to them. Tell them exactly. 
But unfortunately, one time I explained the patient so well that this is what we're going to do. The nurses will come and they're going to start inflating the balloon every two, five minutes or whatever and just let them do it. The patient tried to be helpful and he actually tried to deflate himself and ended up bleeding and we ended up running to him and going, Baba, what did you do? Well, I wanted to help you. So thank you very much. Relax. Don't try to help. So uh, once the thing has been controlled, you could actually deflate uh, when everything is deflated. You don't need to put any pressure dressing. You only need to just to put a simple Band-Aid on it. And this is the beauty of radium. So make sure that when everything is done, uh, hemostasis is shifted and the device can be removed. Uh, check for hematoma, if, anything, if there's anything, you could actually just put a marker on it to cover it. And just cover it with a sterile gauze or a simple, even dressing or a band-aid, depending on what you want. So check the radial uh, definitely and keep the pulse oximeter. It's a nice idea to keep the pulse oximeter on the same hand for a few hours just to keep, make sure everything is okay. But if you see the patient had its uh, capillary refill is good and it, there's no numbness, no complaints, that's okay. So main instruction for the patient for the next 24 hours is to limit bending and uh, fixed arm. Do not submerge the arm in water. Do not lift heavy objects. Do no driving. So assist patient physician check uh, patient documents for liver of consciousness and catheterization sites of bleeding and tumor and uh, lip uh, pulses uh, together. So I wanted to go through the radial fast because the femoral for me is a lost art, the sheet removal of a femoral uh, artery. So number one, let's go to step one. Sheet removal for femoral artery, you need your dressing pack, dry gauze, and personal protective equipment, sterile gloves, sterile drapes, sterile gauze roll, and adhesive bandage, elastoplast or bandage. And sterile suture cutter, if, because sometimes the femoral sheet, it's uh, suture, and atrophy and 500 ml uh, home cell. And the thing is, uh, the funny thing is now, because we're doing more radial uh, as coronary, the structure heart procedure is getting more uh, all in favor, and we're ending up nowadays doing more above than eight and nine French sheath uh, removal. So just to show you a little something, I just took this this morning. This is the classic technique of how to make uh, a roll for a pressure roll. And back in the day when we were in the cath lab, when I was even a student, we, they used to stick us in the room where we used to prepare the old sterile tables. When we used to be, we, now it's all disposable, but we used to have uh, add-on items and, uh, and, and the one that is sterilizable. So we, what they do, they give us a, a, a sterile area to prepare the gauze. The, the nurse aide uh, used to teach us how to do this. So one gauze or two gauze should be longitudinal as is. We can't see the screen now, Mohammed. Uh, do you, are you sharing your screen? Yes. Uh, guys, are you seeing my screen? Yeah. Yes. Mahabi oh, okay. Now I can say it. Okay, I can okay. see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live. Okay. Okay. So now, as you can see, there's, I put the two gauze together just as my base. Guys, I'm making some boosters, so it's okay. So then I took a, a couple of gauze together and, oops, sorry. And the most important thing, when I take those to a couple of gauze together, I stack them not uh, like an elevator, like a steps together, okay? And then whenever I'm rolling, I ha we have to make sure it's tight. The idea is it needs to be pressure. It's not about how big is your roll or how small is your roll. It's called a pressure dressing. If it's soft, it's not doing its job. And that's it. Simple as that, and it should be a nice hard roll. Okay, so a strict patient to keep his leg uh, straight and uh, check ACT before you try to remove the sheath, depending on the ACT, depending on the poly, uh, what ACT the, it's effect, uh, is acceptable. Make sure patient privacy, number one, especially uh, again, regardless male or female, and we try to keep male for male and female for female. Uh, perform harm hygiene, identify. When you're connecting the patient to the monitor, also uh, prepare, make sure that your uh, uh, your blood pressure monitor is every three minutes, one and a half to three minutes. Check uh, femoral puncture site for bleeding before you remove the sheath. Check for bleeding or anything. Check your pulses before you remove the sheath. Make sure uh, to position your left hand fingers above the femoral. So uh, for me, I'm left-handed, beautiful. 
So when we use, I used my ring finger and my middle finger mainly to start feeling the, the pulse. Uh, then what we end up doing, we uh, add my uh, can't remember, my index finger just to press all of it. You have to make them straight. You, can, you know the anatomy bit by bit. Every time you're trying to remove the sheath, you press harder, 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 and keep it straight. Sometimes you get numb, that's a good thing. Let it be numb, stick there, don't try to move. Don't try to clean. And this is a big issue that everyone keeps trying. We used to try to clean. And uh, the other thing is that whenever, once you're, lost, you're okay, you remove the sheath, let a bit of blood come out just to make sure any clot, anything is out. So withdraw the formal sheath slowly, as I said, and so on. This is what I just said. So maintain constant pressure. Now, the thing about uh, giving pressure, they say, okay, you should not do it less than 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes. It's actually about the technique, but when the hospital do a policy it says, you have to do it for 15 minutes uh, exactly, or 20 minutes, then you do five minutes flat, it's actually to protect you. And actually to say that this the person, doctor, nurse, or tech, or whoever, are giving enough time and enough care for that chief now. Most importantly, whenever you remove a sheath, make sure someone is around. Meaning, don't do it in a closed room or something private, yes. People need to know if there's anything needed, you will need help. If there's no shame of asking for help, no matter how senior you are or how uh, you're yeah, confident of yourself. So do not release the pressure dressing until a chief from oral hemisphere. Now, after I finish that 15 or 20 minutes, what I do, that's really good. I look at the bubble. Baba, can you please cough for me? And when I tell him to cough, don't go coughing like a <coughs> really hard cough, like a simple cough. <laughs> if he continues coughing, actually he might bleed again. A simple cough just to test it if it's okay. Then we give another five minutes, five minutes of uh, flat pressure. So, um, yeah. So if there's bleeding or anything, you might need to have someone else to give to clear hematoma bleeding ask them to press, but keep maintaining that area. And you might need to give an additional 10 to 15 minutes and assess again. So it's okay. So uh, clean the partial eye, make sure it was stair gauze and uh, saline, apply large stair gauze roll that we saw on the puncture side, and apply wick under the roll, and I'll show you what's a wick, to give an early indication. Apply strip accordion. So I would like to introduce you to Lenny. Okay, Lenny is actually the line that diabetes used to teach kids about uh, the insulin pumps and things. So today he's a part of uh, CVG. So the wick is a piece of gauze, as you can see here, under the pressure roll, where, uh, and it's actually going outside the pressure dressing. Why? If the, you're a good, very good nurse or a doctor or whoever was putting the pressure dressing and it's so tight, blood would not come out of that uh, thing but blood would accumulate under the throat, so you have to be careful about it. So the other thing is what we are doing is uh, the wick is, so this is an example of the pressure dressing that I did for this patient. This patient is so big, unfortunately doing a tree strip was not comfortable. This is called a figure eight. So a lot of the center, what we used to do for a fumarol, we put tree strips uh, and that's it. Tensor plus or whatever we can. For obese patients, what, I, what I've learned from my instructor in the old days and my senior, there's another way to figure it. Lift the tummy up, put the roll from, starting from the uh, abdomen, go across the leg, around uh, the go cross, under the leg, round, then pull it to the back. This is give, actually give a patient more mobility but and lifting the abdomen a bit high. These are, I would only do usually this for the really obese patient. Now, just to show you another point, if you had a pediatric patient, just I added it since I was doing the role, for a pediatric babies, if you're doing a femoral, uh, a femoral approach, a simple gauze, uh, uh, like doing a sabuse, <laughs> this is the simplest way to do it. Just a simple wrapping of unfolding of the gauze, and it's actually quite strong, it's a very strong pressure. If you try it, you could actually, it's, Quite strong. Even for the radial, in the old days, we used to do this when we used to do the alternate uh, technique. So, so after the femoral sheath is done, you have to check the pulses, identify 
uh, if there's any abnormality in the pulses between the right and left leg, pedal tibial, if there's any hematoma, even if you clear it and it's okay, mark it with the mark it with the pen. Elevate the patient head 30, 40 degree. Instruct the patient he might need uh, able to eat after two hours. Give them sips of hour and for a patient to assist if he's any pain. I teach the patients always about the wick. If they see a bit of blood there, it's a good way for early indication. And I found it very helpful. And uh, complete documentation. Now, documentation. When you say documentation. Size of the sheath, so what we used to learn, uh, Turkey, if he's online and the old guys remember that, six French, right femoral artery, sheath removed by Muhammad Jaha, no bleeding, no hematoma, no complication, or there was a slight uh, bleeding, controlled whatever. Uh, one important thing that I also like to remind everyone, and, and uh, whoever uh, remember this, I always say, it. most common complication we used to have during sheath removal was vasovagal. And uh, what we used to, and uh, how we used to treat uh, vasovagal is by kufta. And kufta, you remember it by, I think I told you about that. So kufta is C O F T A. Cough, oxygen, fluid, tilt the bed, meaning tilt the bed, head back, and atropin. So remember your kufta, and if you're hungry as me. So provide patient education, wound care, check patient dressing site, and everything. And proper handover is good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Mohammed, so much. It was a very nice presentation. My question is the kofta is fried or grilled? No, I think it's steamed nowadays. <laughs> Any question, guys? I, I have a question, Mohammed. Um, um, not many cath labs, they have the TR bands. Bye. So what is the alternatives for, for, uh, for the pressure? Other companies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, okay, but if you want to talk about the manual pressure dressing, the old techniques, um, and some techniques, unfortunately, we used to use a tourniquet, okay. if you remember, okay? So uh, it was a pressure roll, and the tourniquet was the old, old technique, and then the pressure dressing, simple as that. And they still, I've seen that in Mauritania when I went for charity those days. And Dr. Khaled, the, the same subject for the post procedure, we had a patient who had hematoma. I ended up, the, uh, the first day I was scrubbing and inside the lab, but the next three days, I ended up teaching the nurses post care of radial, really more, because, they did, because they didn't have the radial band. Yeah, and I think the most important thing is patent hemostasis. So mm. you don't compress too hard to occlude the exactly. vessel, which, yeah. And this is the word hemostasis, going back to normal. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? Yes, Dr. Uh, uh, because there was a question uh, from one of our colleagues uh, that they don't have TR bands. And okay. I think I, I, one of the colleagues from Sudan. So okay. if you don't have a TR band, you can actually create your own uh, patent hemostasis. There are two ways to do it. Uh, one of them is very crude, in which you get a 10 cc uh, plastic or glass ampoule of, uh, of anything. And you, uh, you put it, you wrap it along the radial artery like, like this, like a pen, and then you wrap around it so there's more pressure on the radial and less pressure on the ulna. Uh, and then you can actually uh, check the hand oximetry and make sure that you're not occluding the blood to the hand. Or you can do it with a piece of gauze, like, Mah like uh, Muhammad Jarrah just showed us on the femoral, but on the radial. So you put more pressure on the radial and then you apply, I, I was hoping, uh, yeah, like this. Yeah, put it on yeah. your radial, here, Muhammad. Please. So it's simple pressure as this. And then it's actually, this is the way where you do it for the pediatric femoral. It's the same yeah. type of rod. And then it's a strong, and then that's. Exactly. Or you can put one which is longitudinal, actually, if you wish, yeah, on the radial and tie it, okay, on the radial, which is near the thumb, and make and then the, fem, the ulnar is free. And you have to be sure. Uh, this is uh, another way of uh, what we call in Arab, in Egypt, baladi, patent hemostasis. <laughs> Uh, which costs nothing. Okay, it costs nothing. <laughs> uh, after a while, you know. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea.
idea is that you, you, you need patent hemostasis because if you don't do patent hemostasis, as Dr. Khaled said, nothing will happen. I mean, the patient, everything will be fine. The patient will go home, but their artery is actually going to get occluded in like 10% of cases instead of 1% of cases. And when their artery gets occluded, you won't find out because they won't have any complaints, but you will only find out the next time they come for a cardiac cath or a PCI that you can't use this radial artery anymore, uh, which is very annoying, you know, and, and it should not happen. So um, don't leave the radial sheath in for two hours. Somebody wrote that they leave the radial sheath in for two hours. Mm. You should remove the radial sheath the moment you finish, regardless of what the patient has taken, even if they had taken thrombolytic. And the femoral sheath, of course, can be left till, uh, till the uh, ACT goes down. If you don't, what if you don't have, how many of the attendees actually use activated clotting time? I mean, if, if you don't use it, uh, there is an algorithm. I mean, if you've given the patient uh, uh, five or 10,000 units of heparin, it depends on the French sheath. So if you have a femoral six French sheath and you uh, don't have ACT and you're not going to test, you will leave it between four and six hours, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So the problem is you, you guys in the Gulf and in Saudi have all the equipment, but it's not available everywhere. There are many places which don't use ACT. Yes. So. That's true. That's actually true. That's actually true. Heba was asking a question. If you're doing a PCI, Femoral. Would you prefer to do a closure device or um, or manual compression? Dr. Who are you asking? Dr. 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 Farid, yeah. sorry. Okay, so first, uh, you can't close a bad puncture. As I told you, if it's too high, you can't close it. If it's too low, you can't close it. And so there is some exception to too low. If it's the SFA is too mm. big, that you can pass mm. a device, so you can close it. However, uh, most of the time, that's my practice, and it's not the guidelines. For early mobilization and early hemostasis, uh, closure device is advocated, specifically for large core, something higher than 8 or 10, 14 in the in, in impellers, or even higher for cabin, where you can use one or two closure device, suture-based uh, per close. However, for me personally, if the fl workflow is not affected, I prefer manual compression done by a trained individual. Uh, when I was a fellow, I compressed almost a thousand uh, groin. And I do believe that closure, the best closure device is manual compression. Uh, I agree. For too many reasons. Because when you, because manual compression, uh, first, actually, it, it, it helped me improve my French because True. my interventional cardiology and during uh, compressing the patient thigh, you have to talk to them. It's 20 minutes. You have to talk. So I was training my French uh, during that time. Uh, uh, I, and it will make you a better interventionalist when you really compress the femoral. So that's what I teach my fellow. Compress as many femoral as much as you can because you can know. It's about feeling. It's not something that uh, you see. When you feel the artery, you, the round structure of the vessel, how to compress. Mm. I think uh, that's uh, that's from my experience. I prefer like in, it's unreasonable. In in, uh, in Egypt, where they have maybe uh, 20 uh, cases per day in one lab, yes, compression might not be uh, a good solution because it requires manpower. Maybe closure mm. device is more cost effective. Uh, but if it, if it's empty and, uh, and you, Someone no, we have we have a lot of staff. Yeah, I would prefer yeah. compression. We have a lot of staff. We have a lot of staff, so we always have people who can compress. And in Egypt, oh, okay. the price of the entire diagnostic coronary angiogram, the entire diagnostic coronary angiogram, is cheaper than the price of the closure device. So we only use the closure <laughs> devices, like you said, for the for the for the large bore like Tavi, where you have to use a closure device, or you can use a closure device if there's a compelling reason uh, to move the patient early. For instance, mm. if you're going to move the patient to dialysis, okay, or for something else, 
and you want to move them early um, before all the effect of the heparin has uh, waned off. Because I, I'm not very fond of reversing the effect of heparin. That was my no. question to you, Dr. Khaled and uh, Mr. Meher and Mohammed. Uh, what do you think when people uh, use protamine? Uh, what is, how, do, how often do you use protamine? How often do you reverse heparin? For, for, for us, we, actually, for my last 20 years, we never use it. Okay. Yeah. Unless, Me unless too. You, have, you have a strong reason for that. But in yeah, other like words, perforation or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even if there is a coronary complication, I know in the algorithm they say reverse heparin immediately. I yeah. think reversing is a bad, a bad idea because actually you can yeah. have thrombosis, which oh. is the enemy of uh, bleeding, and you can control Agreed. bleeding by other measures. Reversing is not a good option unless the patient is bleeding from his nose or ears and he's dying from the But I've never reversed in my life. I never reversed a, a, a heparin. I, I want to add small I, points for using for using closure device to the femoral artery. I think if, if you use the closure device, you will have some limitation if you need to use the same area in some devices. I think. Yes. So, um, and also one thing uh, uh, someone told me, like when you have a day case and he's like normal coronary. Which is more fair, more fair, doing a femoral, uh, manual femoral removal or putting a device? Like so, uh, a physician used to tell me, uh, if he's normal, keep him normal. Should yeah, I put I, I don't like to leave, the idea is I don't like to leave any uh, soldier behind because you leave, even if it's with a bioabsorbable one like the NG seal, it's leaving something behind. Uh, manual compression, it's allowing the normal. Uh, natural hemostasis to happen so the artery will heal by itself without having a, nor a foreign body there. Uh, I actually, uh, I'm 63 years old, uh, but I still, uh, and I have done angios, uh, my parents are dead a long time ago, but I, during their life, I did angios for them because they had coronary issues and both angios were successful. And when I did my parents, uh, I pressed their legs myself. I refused to let anybody else uh, do my father or my mother. And uh, that was, my father was pretty early at my career. And since that time, I felt that it is a big act of courtesy to the patient for me either to press the leg myself or to be there while it's being done. Sometimes if I'm tired, one of my colleagues will do it, but I will always be there. And like uh, Dr. Khalid said, and I said, we think the access is very important. But we are always going to be able to do the best of the best. Seriously, the best of the best in removing everything and leaving the patient. The patient might uh, not remember that you put three stents in them, but they will remember a big hematoma in their leg and a bruise and it's going to take a lot of your reputation, exactly. especially if you're in private medicine. And I think it is a huge act of courtesy and importance to, even if you're not going to be there, to go and have a look, make yep. sure that everything is fine. I think that final touch is really super important. Yeah, I agree with Prof. Uh, Hani. One, one of my senior uh, who was, I was trained with uh, in, in Canada, he told me that access and closure is your signature. That's how the patient will remember you. He will not remember you saving his life. He will not no. remember you pl placing a very nice IVIS guided left main. No. He will remember the puncture. He will remember the poke. He will remember how the compression happened. So I think it's yeah. your signature, as he said, and it's, it will remain true. with the patient forever. It's true. Okay, there's a lot of questions, but I think we are out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Professor Hani, uh, last word. Thank you. Uh, the meeting was um, amazing. Um, as usual, you know, I, I did not think I was going to learn a lot of new things, but I did. I learned uh, from all presentations, and I actually learned from the questions. Yeah. So it was it was absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm sorry I had a cat behind me. It is she's still there, but now I put a virtual background. <laughs> no, I have two cats. Like 
I know, but I, I, swimming I have in the sea two now. cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have two cats which don't leave me at all. Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to thank Metronic for sponsoring the evening. Uh, I would like to thank uh, 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 Dr. Khaled Al Juhani for am amazing presentations, um, Mr. Meher Zaki for his contributions and eloquent points, practical points, uh, which um, um, reflected many of the questions asked, and of course, uh, the maestro, uh, Mohammed Jaha, for uh, organizing all this. and. Uh, the smooth running. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. And thank you all attendees. And thank you very much. Take care. Thank good. you so much. Inshallah, guys, thank get you. ready for next week. Inshallah, it's your, the topic everyone wanted. It will be an ECG basics and ECG access. But we have Mr. Abdelhaman Nusayef, who is a master's degree from UK and an educator for uh, the, in the King Child University. And yeah. Stay safe and shukran uh, There's everyone. one question, Thank you. one more question. There's one more yes. question here, Mohammed. From, mm -hmm. uh, there's a question on the chat now uh, from mm -hmm. Elvis, uh, okay. who's saying, uh, how do you know that you're not applying too much pressure to the femoral artery? One of the very good things to do is uh, when you're still learning, uh, when mm -hmm. one of your friends is putting pressure on the femoral artery, feel the dorsalis pedis, tibial. especially if it has been present or the anterior tibial and make sure that there is some flow. If, uh, tell them, please push harder. They will push harder, and then you will see the flow disappear under your hand. And tell them, okay, lift your hand very, very gently. The moment you start feeling pulse, it's probably a very good uh, level of pressure. And you will learn how to do that by time. And also, if the patient starts complaining, yeah. you should be careful. Uh, be very careful with elderly women who are osteoporotic, you can actually oh. break their legs. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, very, much. Much. Thank Thank you very much, so everyone. Much. And do the evaluation, everyone, to get the certification. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.